Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is the executive director of the BC La Labor Heritage Center. They do a tremendous job of bringing the history and voices of working people uh, in BC to life. I'd please welcome Donna Sakuda. Thank you very much. Uh, as I was introduced, the executive director of the BC Labor Heritage Center, and our, on behalf of our board of directors, and many of whom are here as delegates from their unions, I want to thank the BC Federation of Labor for the opportunity to speak today. I bring regrets from our board chair, Joey Hartman, who could not be here. We were founded in 2004 by union members. They wanted to make sure that the stories of the workers who built BC were remembered and celebrated. We are exceedingly grateful to the BC Fed and our other sponsoring unions. If your union is not sponsoring us right now, I'm sure one of our board members will be happy to talk with you. This year, we completed two major projects. The first is called Union Zindabad. For those who don't know, Zindabad translates loosely as long live the union. It's a groundbreaking history of South Asian Canadians in the BC labor movement. Our second project, major project this year, was the dedication of the new Asbestos Memorial on the Vancouver waterfront, just steps from here. This project was five years in the making, and it is the first in North America to recognize the terrible toll that asbestos has taken on workers and their families. Labor history is important to all of us. We're making history here today. We can tell our children and our grandchildren about being at the 60th BC Federation of Labor Convention, about the debates that took place, about hearing the John Horgan water story. <laughs> and I hope you will be able to tell your children and grandchildren about meeting a remarkable person a man who changed the BC labor movement and on whose shoulders we stand today. I'd like to invite our board member, Rod Mickleborough, who is a retired labor reporter, author of On the Line, The History of the British Columbia Labor Movement, and our podcast host to make the introduction. Rod? Uh, thanks very much, Donna. And I must say it seems strange to be up here on the podium of a BC Federation of Labor convention after all those years I spent down in the trenches covering the Fed for the Sun, the province, BC, CBC TV, and the Globe and Mail in the days when there actually were labor reporters. But I actually, I'm very proud to be here on this particular occasion, and it's, it's inspiring to hear from all those young workers, but to tell you about a very special labor leader, someone who has been part of the BC labor movement, if you can believe it, for most of the past 74 years. And that's longer than Queen Elizabeth reigned over England. And I'm talking about Brother Ray Haynes of the BC Federation of Labor, head of the BC Federation of Labor from 1966 to 1973, and arguably the most influential leader in the long history of the BC Fed. Under his hands-on leadership, the BC labor movement became by far the most militant in the country as it fought tooth and nail against hard-nosed employers and the reactionary anti-union government of W.A.C. Bennett. The son of a Vancouver police detective, Ray Haynes started his working life on the green chain at the long gone Canadian white pine sawmill on the Fraser River. It was there that he learned the basics of trade unionism from the I.W.A. 
and that's 20-year-old Ray Haynes, second from the left there with the big grin and the hat. A few years later, Brother Haynes was working, of all things, as a tea blender, whatever that was, in the wholesale division of Hudson's Bay. Fed up with the pay and working conditions, he organized the place. That's... <laughs> Signed up 29 of the 30 workers. That skill didn't go unnoticed, and he was soon hired by Retail Wholesale, where he rose to international representative and then to secretary treasurer of the BC Federation of Labor in 1966. The top person was always the secretary treasurer in those days. And uh, it was, it's hard to imagine today how tough it was for unions back then. It was a time when labor leaders regularly went to jail for defying court injunctions against picketing. Ray liked to recall, I'd been on the job one day and already 10 more people were in jail for contempt of court. And he was often down at the courthouse speaking out against the latest jailing. Labor was in almost constant warfare, strike after strike, protests seemingly every day. And, a, and that all-out fight against the terrible anti-union legislation brought in by the, by the Socreds. He galvanized the, the Federation to treat every dispute as its own, rallying support for unions when they needed it, and enforcing policies that remain today, respect for picket lines and hot boycotts. And uh, there's Ray uh, supporting one of the postal worker strikers. I'll say no more. It was a different time, and Ray Haynes and the Federation were everywhere. When he talked, people listened. At the same time, Brother Haynes broadened the interests of the Federation beyond the immediate, in, the immediate issues of the BC labor movement. The organization backed Cesar Chavez and his courageous campaign to organize California's farm work, California farm workers to the hilt. And some of you may be old enough to, remain, to remember that struggle. By declaring a boycott of non-union picked grapes in unionized supermarkets in BC. And it was the most effective such action in North America. As the Vietnam War raged, Ray Haynes was a frequent speaker at peace rallies opposing the war. Like this one at Peace Arch Park. In 1971, he did something remarkable. He called on union workers to stop work for 30 minutes to protest the United States plan to test an atomic bomb on Amchitka Island in Alaska. Hard-hatted construction workers paraded through downtown Vancouver in response. For the first time in North America, said Ray, workers are downing tools, not over wages, not over working conditions, but because of a danger to all mankind. But nothing highlighted the powerful force the BC Federation of Labour became under Ray Haynes' leadership. Nothing highlighted it more than Labour's four-year fight against Bill 33, one of the most anti-union laws in Canadian history. The bill created a mediation commission that had the power to settle any labour dispute in the province, private sector and the public sector, by binding arbitration. What did the Fed do? They organized a four-year boycott of the commission. It held, and the commission proved a total failure. There was also constant struggle on the ground. In fact, there was so much industrial relations turmoil that voters finally turned their back on W.A.C. Bennett and elected B.C.'s first NDP government, led by Dave Barrett, who changed the face of the province. Not everyone in the labor movement loved Ray Haynes, who was the VC Federation of Labor after all, and he had to fight off a few challenges over the years, but he won them all. But after seven tumultuous years at the top, he stepped down from the Fed in 1973. But you can't keep a labor man down, and he was soon back in the labor movement, hired by the BC Nurses Union, a different BC Nurses Union, to lead a tough organizing drive in BC's long-term care facilities, helping with arbitrations and being a mentor to union members. After that, 
there was work for more unions and many years as the Sunshine Coast representative for the BC Federation of Retired Union Members, although I'm not sure Ray ever really retired. During his many years on picket lines, legal and illegal, illegal, Brother Haynes somehow managed to avoid being arrested. Finally, in 2012, as part of his lifelong commitment to environmentalism, he was among a group of protesters who blockaded a coal train headed to Roberts Bank and was arrested. He was 84 years old and still on the line. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I ask you to acknowledge the great Ray Haynes. Ray, get up there. Thank you very much. Uh, it's all too much for me today. And I was told that I didn't have to speak, but I can see that with that kind of an introduction, wow, if I didn't speak, I don't, I don't know what I would do. Uh, I, I, I was here for, as you heard, from 66 until 65 and until 73. And I, I had a terrific life. I have to tell you that. And I try and tell young people now that don't take a job that you're not going to be happy with just because it pays a bit more money. That's very important to, that you get a proper salary. But you sure got to have a job that you like. And I used to be able to jump out of bed every morning and rush to the BC Federation of Labor, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, I left in 73. Um, thinking that I would have a new kind of life, and instead I was back very quickly doing labor work on, on a, a contract basis, and then finally 10 years, which were very good with the BC Nurses Union, where I, uh, myself and two nurses, organized about 1,000 long-term care workers. And I've always felt good about that. Uh, when I quit the BC Federation of Labor, they had to hire two guys to do my job. <laughs> the, pre the president and the secretary treasurer. I found out later, though, that they had to do that to clean up the mess. <laughs> uh, I always thought that this federation spoke out more than any other federation. I don't want to belittle the others, but I can tell you that we were the only labor federation or that kind of a group in North America that, that did a, such a job on the great workers' strike. And we got invited down to Cesar Chavez's uh, location down in the States. So we, we did a lot uh, to, uh, we actually said don't buy the grapes and, and, and everybody else was saying don't buy the grapes and then we said well that's not quite enough, let's not handle the grapes. And we had a couple of produce outfits and we stopped handling them. We convinced the Teamsters to stop handling the grapes and I think that was a contribution, uh, quite a contribution to winning the strike. I got a kick out of, uh, I got a kick out of the fact that uh, uh, the labor movement uh, was a very important movement and they only had three labor reporters covering the situation at that time. 
And uh, now, I don't know what the labor movement's got to do to get something in the press, but it's very, very difficult. And they, they don't have anybody really <coughs> as a labor reporter. So we still got a big job to do. And I'm very honored and pleased to be invited here today. And I happen to be in, in town tonight for a poker game, so. <laughs> With, with some old labor friends, it was a, it was a way we celebrated uh, the convention. Um, we'd play after the sh service here, sometimes till 2 o'clock in the morning. Some guys went longer, but I got out at 2. And, and uh, it was uh, an honor to be in the Federation at that time. Uh, I don't know what else I can tell you is that I, I'm just so happy to see all these faces here and, and everything and keep up the good fight and I got a couple more years behind me so I'll try and be with you. I did get arrested. I never got arrested for all my labor stuff, I don't know why. but. I did get arrested for blocking a train down at White Rock, but it was a bit embarrassing because when they tried to get me in the police car, they had a terrible time. My legs were falling apart and all that kind of stuff. And then when we went into the police office, everybody had to lay on the floor. Not me. They gave me a chair. <laughs> so I've had a chair here today, and I thank you very much and wish you well.